studying the life of Joseph. Now, Joseph is very close to my heart because when God gave the vision for Influence Church, he ministered that vision through the life of Joseph. And over the next three Saturdays, we'll be studying the life of Joseph from slavery to the prison to the palace. Tonight, we're starting in that space speaking about the influence of a slave. And I want to turn your attention to Genesis chapter 37. And anybody can tell me who wrote the book of Genesis? Moses. Wonderful. Let's give Leah a round of applause, our Bible student. I hear somebody sitting back say, Jesus. <laughs> Genesis chapter 37. And you can follow on the screen if you have a Bible with you, you can read as well. It says, now Israel loved Joseph. Now, when we speak about Israel in this context, we are, we are speaking about Jacob, the father of Joseph. Jacob was renamed to Israel by an angel of God because he wrestled all night and said, I will not let go until you bless me, God. His name was changed, and from this name, Israel was birthed, the nation of Israel. From Jacob was birthed the 12 tribes of Israel. And this is one of the 12 tribes, Joseph. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. Now, I want to let you know that this verse starts off problematic. For the parents in this house that read this verse and think that it is a biblical principle, it is not. Joseph is in problems because of his father. As a parent in this room, and we will heavily tackle this this year when we speak on parenting, you cannot love another child more than another. You may bless one more than the other because they are more responsible, but you can never love one more than the other. How would you feel if God loved one of us more than he did of the other? God loves every single one of his creation equally, unconditionally, from the sinner to the saint. He loves you. So Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was a son of his old age. Now, it's very important to understand that Joseph was the firstborn son of Rebekah, the woman whom Jacob, his father, truly loved. You see, Jacob was a deceiver, and all his tricks ended up backfiring him because he tried to marry the younger sister of his uncle Laban, and he ended up with the older sister Leah. His uncle deceived him, and then later he had to work another seven years to get the hand of Rachel, the one whom he really loved. Joseph is the firstborn out of the woman whom he loved. And there is this special attachment from the brokenness that has happened, but it should have never been that way. And he loves Joseph more than the others. So he made him a tunic of many colors. And it says that when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, hmm, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. In other words, they rough up that small man real, real bad. Now, because the story of Joseph is lengthy, you are going to have homework. You're going to have to read through Genesis chapters 37 till 42 to get the full story. But I'm going to be jumping through and filling you in on tonight's passage, which is Joseph in Potiphar's house. So this is the backstory. Verse 6, it says, So he said to them, Joseph, because he had a dream, he said to them, please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There we were binding sheaves in the field. And then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood up upright. And indeed, your sheaf stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brother said to him, shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? And so they hated him even more because of his words. Dream number one, Joseph had another dream. Dream number two, then he dreamed still another dream. And he told us to his brothers and he said, look, I have dreamed another dream. And this time the sun and the moon and the 11 stars bowed down to me. And so he told it to his father and to his brothers and his fathers. His father rebuked him. Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come and bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him even more. The envy and hatred built up so much in his brothers that one day his father sent Joseph out to the fields to meet his brothers. And when they saw Joseph come in, they plotted to murder him. They built up so much hatred for their own blood that they were ready to kill him. He gets there 
and his older brother Reuben, the oldest of the twelve, tries to spare him and he tries to convince his brothers, do not kill him. Instead, toss him into this pit here. Let him just suffer a little bit. Reuben leaves for a little while. And while he's gone, a caravan of Ishmaelites is passing by. And Judah comes up with an idea and says, okay, let's not shed his blood. Let's sell him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver sold into slavery. This is now where we find Joseph in Genesis chapter 39. He is now a slave, betrayed by his own brothers. And it says, now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. And Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. And it says, the Lord was with Joseph, and he was successful. Tell somebody next to you, the Lord is with you. And he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him. And that the Lord had made all that he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in the sight of his master. And he served him. Then Potiphar made him overseer of his house. And all that he had, he put under his authority. And this is where we're going to conclude tonight. Verse 7. And it came to pass, after these things, he was overseer over the house of Potiphar. Slave but still influential, that his master's wife cast longing eyes. <laughs> I like how the Bible says this. Longing eyes on Joseph. And she said, what did she say? Lie with me. But he refused and said his master, he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in this house. And he has committed all that he has into my hands. There is no one greater in this house than I. Nor has he kept back anything from me but you. Because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Tonight, for the next few minutes, I'm going to speak to you from the title of The Influence of a Slave. From the Life of of Joseph. Can you take your right hand, place it over your heart tonight, and let us pray. Heavenly Father, speak to our hearts tonight. We want to fulfill purpose, God. God, like Joseph, we want to be a person of influence. This is the vision of this house. This is the vision that you have called us to. So God, by your word, speak to our hearts tonight. That your word will bring forth fruit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated tonight. This entire story of Joseph starts off with a dream. He has a dream. According to medical news today, dreams are a state of consciousness characterized by sensory, cognitive, and emotional occurrences during sleep. The dreamer has reduced control over the content, the visual images, and even the activation of memory. I want to repeat that, right? The dreamer has reduced control. I said in some men free tonight. The dreamer has reduced control over the context and the visual images. Any man ever woke up in the morning and the wife vexed for something you do and she dream? The dreamer has reduced controls. Well, obviously you have no control over what you do in, your, in her dream. And Joseph has a dream. This dream is from God. This dream is meant to show Joseph a picture of the plan that God has for his life. And I want to speak to the people in the house tonight that have a dream from God. That you know God has called you to something great. He's shown you a picture of it. He's shown you a glimpse of it. Even if you're in a space tonight and you don't know the dream, the plan that God has for you, guess what? This is a place... To fulfill destiny. And God gives Joseph a dream. When we were setting up uh, the vision of this church and I was writing it down in paper, I remember having a dream one night. And I don't remember a lot of my dreams, but this one out of the million dreams that I've had ever since, this is one that has stuck with me and I'm able to recall to memory. And I dreamt stepping into a room that was large in capacity 
and that was filled with young adults that was waiting to hear the word of God preached. And it was my responsibility to preach God's word in that setting. I don't know how God is fulfilling those dreams, but he started in this house. And I want you to know right now, wherever you may be in life, that God has started in your life. He has started and he who has begun a good work is faithful and just to complete it until the end. Joseph had two dreams. Now these are two different dreams. They are not the same. The first dream showed his sheaves, his sheep standing up straight and his brother's sheaves bowing down to his. And it set the tone that he was meant to rule over his brothers. But the second dream is different. In the second dream, he sees the moon, the sun, and the stars, 11 of them representing the 11 tribes of Jacob, bowing down to him. Why is the second dream important? Because in the second dream, the moon is meant to represent his mother. But his mother Rachel is dead at this point in time. You see, his mother Rachel died in childbirth bearing forth the last son, Benjamin. So for him to see a representation of his mother and his father and all his brothers bowing down meant that he was not just to lead his house, but he was meant to lead the generations to come. The second dream is different from the first. It expounds on what God really had for Joseph's life. But I see Joseph making two mistakes when he received the dream from God. The first mistake that Joseph makes is who he told it to. He received this dream, and he goes to his brothers. He goes to the people that already hate him to tell them about this dream. Now, there's a backstory to why his brothers already hate him. They hate him because of his coat. Stephen, could you just hand me that apparel? They hate him because of his coat. Now, I didn't have any colorful outfits. So I borrowed this from my wife. Jessica borrowed this, right? It's the most colorful thing, first thing that popped out of my eye when I opened her closet. How is it? Good? <laughs> he had a multicolored coat. Now, his colorful coat was not a fashion statement. You see, in ancient time, the colors of your garment would oftentimes depict authority and favor. And his coat was already foreshadowing that his father loved him so much that most likely his father was going to give him rulership over his house. That's why they hated him. Because the firstborn, Reuben, is meant to be the one that gets the double inheritance and the blessing of his father to lead his clan. But Joseph is already being favored by his father. This robe is meant to set some type of authority over his life, already foreshadowing what his father desired from him. And it brings this hatred and he goes to the same people that hate him to tell them about his wonderful dream of what God wants to do. And now the idea of what they already are thinking. See, they already think Joseph is going to take power. They already think Joseph is going to rule over them. And the idea of what they already thinking becomes solidified by the dream that he shares with them. And the hatred that is already there festers into something even more dark and dangerous. I want to tell you in this house tonight, be careful who you tell your dreams to. Joseph goes to the wrong people to tell his dreams. I know you love your family. I know you love your brothers and sisters. But they may not be able to understand the dreams that God has placed over your life. Because they see you as the youngest. They see you as the youth. They see you as the one that is unqualified. Joseph was the father's son, his favorite. He didn't even have to do any roles and responsibilities at home. He was treated differently. And your brothers and sisters may not understand God's call over your life. So before you are broken down by the same people that you desire to build you up, keep your dreams between you and God and the people that he will align in your life to fulfill those dreams. He goes to the wrong people. Secondly, I see 
The mistake that he makes is that not only does he go to the wrong people, but he allows the wrong people to interpret his dreams. Genesis chapter 37 and verse 8. It says that when he tells his brothers of his dreams, his brother says, and his brothers respond, Shall it indeed be that you will reign over us? Shall you indeed have what? Dominion over us. This was not God's interpretation. As a matter of fact, nobody in this setting right now has the gift of interpretation of dream. Joseph doesn't even have that gift until later down when he is in the prison. I want you to understand this interpretation is not from God. His brothers see it as a power move. God meant it for purpose. And if you go to the wrong people to explain your dreams for you, they will tell you satanic principles and not kingdom principles. Because God's kingdom is never about power and fame and position, but it's about fulfilling purpose. And if you go to the wrong sources, hey, this is what God has placed in my life. This is what God wants to do with me. They might tell you, well, you know, you can make some good money out of that. You can buy some big houses with that. That gift, you can sell that. You can sell that and you can build a legacy and a legend for yourself out of the money that you can make. If you go to the wrong places to interpret your dream, you would expect something that is opposite from God's definition. And he goes to the wrong people and he allows the wrong people to interpret his dream. I want you to write this down tonight. Those that are taking notes, you can use your phone as well. Write this down. Don't be quick to jump to conclusions over God's calling for your life. Don't be quick to jump to conclusions over God's calling for your life. When I was 22, I was teaching a youth class for ages 12 to 14. At that time, I was a Sunday school teacher in the church that I was in. And while teaching them that Sunday morning, I was teaching them from a routine lesson that I'd planned the day before. And the main scripture that I was teaching from said, lay not your treasures on earth where mud and rust would destroy it, but instead lay up treasures in heaven that are eternal. And somehow when I spoke those words to those kids that didn't even care to hear it, somehow in that moment, I felt this deep conviction from the Holy Spirit. A verse that I heard many times, that I quoted many times, illuminated in that moment and drawed me into this call that I felt that drive in that moment that God was calling me to do more. I felt in that moment that God was just speaking by his Holy Spirit to not lay up any treasures upon this earth, but instead start working more in his kingdom to lay up eternal treasures. And it was in that moment that I felt that conviction that God was ready for me to do more in ministry. I didn't know what that would mean. I didn't know what it would look like. And in my mind and in my interpretation, I didn't know what God wanted from me. I knew at that point that I was doing all that I could possibly be doing in ministry. So I approached my pastor at that time and I shared with him that conviction that I was having from the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, I was met with disappointment. Because while I felt this deep call, when I shared this conviction, I was met with a disappointment that there was not opportunity or space to develop that call. And I remember going through a period of seeking God for what's next. Because from my interpretation, from my point of view, I expected to fulfill the purpose of God and the call of God in the place that I called home, in the place that I grew up in, in the place that I learned and grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God. And God had to pull me out of that comfort zone, take me out of my spiritual father's house, so that I could step into truly the person that he had called me to be. Don't jump to conclusions over God's call for your life. You see, it might not look like what you expect it to be. 
Joseph expected it to be rulership over his father's house. That was not God's plan for him. God's plan was much bigger. And I want you to know you might be limiting the dream of God because you are interpreting it through the environment that has sustained you. But God wants to take you out of that environment and open your horizon to walk on waters, to go beyond borders, and to take you even deeper. God's picture is bigger than your imagination. And in the disappointment... Joseph is sold into slavery. He expected one thing, but it ended up a different way. And we see this severing of ties with his relatives. And I would have preached to you on the same topic from Abraham in our old year's night into New Year's Eve service, that Abraham had to leave his relatives to go to that call that God has for him. Joseph didn't get to leave. He was cut off. He was kicked out. And it may not be so pretty for you. You may not leave. You might be pushed out the door. You might be betrayed. You might be stabbed in your back by the same people that you expected to build you up in this life. The same people that you expected to support you to fulfill those dreams. It might be the same people that cut ties with you and want nothing to do with you. Joseph didn't have it easy. He was kicked out of his father's house. He was sold into slavery. He moved from a place where he owned things to a place where he was owned by someone as a thing. He moved from a place where he knew the culture and the community to a place where he did not understand the Egyptian cultures and all their gods and all their rituals and he had no community. He was isolated and alone. He moved from a place where he was loved to a place where he was hated and treated like less than because he was now a slave in Potiphar's house. And in that place, he faces disappointment. His heart is broken. Death might have been, death might have been mercy compared to what he faced. To go through the disappointment and the heartbreak of the same people that you love tried to murder you and instead sell you out into slavery. I want you to understand and I want to paint a picture in your mind of the pain that Joseph has to go through when he's sold into slavery. He didn't just be, well, he wasn't just sold into slavery and it was like, oh, well, all things are work out together for my good. No, he went through the pain and the depression and the hurt and the tragedy of the moment that he faced. And whatever you face right now, don't underestimate or undermine the pain that you feel. You see, for too many times in Christian communities, when we face difficult seasons, when we face those seasons where we are discouraged and disappointed, we think we should just shove it down and move on. We don't want to process the pain and the hurt. We don't want to find healing and forgive the people that have hurt us. And if you don't find healing for that pain, guess what? It will cause you problems in your purpose. And what I love about Joseph is even though he is discouraged, he takes time to heal. With his brokenness, he pours it out to God. And with a broken and contrite heart, God lifts his spirit up. And in his place of disappointment, Joseph is determined. He is determined because he has a dream that was, faith, that was rested upon his life by God. And I don't know what your disappointment might be. Maybe you've been betrayed by a husband. Maybe you were betrayed by a co-worker. Maybe you were betrayed by a business partner. I don't know what that betrayal might be. But I came to tell you tonight, cast your burdens on Jesus because he cares for you. You can find healing at the cross. At the cross, he was nailed, he was bruised, he was buried. But at the cross is where that moment of healing comes. And he was resurrected back to life. And no matter how deep into the grave you feel like you've been buried, I want you to know God wants to birth you back to life through the resurrection power of Jesus, you can find that fulfillment and that healing in his presence. And Joseph is betrayed, but he does not let the pain control him. He moves to a place of determination. And in his determination, the first thing that he does, 
is he forgets the former things. He forgets the former things. He had it nice in his father's house. He had everything he wanted. But he could not change his situation. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. You can't change what has happened to you, but you can control what happens next. You can't change what has happened to you, but you can control what happens next. He can't change his predicament. He's a slave now. He can't change it, but he can control what happens next. And the first thing he has to do to get that drive and determination to press on is he has to forget the former things. He has to forget all that he expected out of life. Because now the narrative has changed. And I want to ask you tonight, have you been holding on to the past? Have you been holding on to your broken expectations? Have you been holding on to what you thought people would do for you? And now because you are holding on to the past, you can't move forward. Paul says, I forget the former things. And I press on towards the mark of the high calling of God. And I came to tell somebody in this house tonight, it has been too long. It has been too many years that you've been wallowing on your past. It's time to forget the past. Deal with it. Heal from it. Leave it there. And press forward. Move on to the mark of the high calling. Forget the former things. And what I see a lot in our society, I see this problem a lot. Too many people are dependent instead of determined. Too many. Too many are dependent instead of determined. I was filling out a form yesterday, and for the first time, I had to fill out this column that asks if you have any dependents. And I wrote one, because I have a two-year-old, so he's a dependent. He depends on me. He needs his parents to care for him. But some of you are 20 years old, and you still want to be dependent. Some of you are 40 years old talking about if my father had only given me land, if my father had given me a car, I would have a good start in life. If he'd give me a house, he'd live in it by himself. If you give me some money, you're counting your mother's pension right now. And if you remain dependent, you will never move to determination. You can't depend on someone else to get you to where God has called you. Joseph has nothing. His father was willing to give him everything. God had to break it out of him. And God might take some blessings that you expected from your parents out of your life so you can build some determination and some fortitude within you to be determined this year to press forward and do all that God has called you to do. I'm not depending on a man. I'm not depending on networking. I'm not depending on someone else's resources to build the life that God has called me to be. I am determined to fulfill God's call. He is determined. He is determined. I want to speak to the men in this house just for a little bit. Because a lot of boys aren't becoming men because they are too dependent on their parents. I will say it as it is. You want to be a mama's boy for the rest of your life? You will never be able to love your wife. You got to leave and cleave. And I'm going to be hitting it hard as we move into next month with relationships. So if you don't want to hear it, don't come. You got to leave and cleave. You've been too dependent on your mother's cooking. Buy some food or learn how to cook. <laughs> no, we live in a generation where boys are still breastfeeding. It's time to be a man. Forget the former things. Stop being dependent. The second thing that I see Joseph do as he's determined to fulfill God's purpose is he is faithful in the footling. Faithful in the footling. Now, I know footling is not a word that we use too often. It was the closest way to get across the meaning that I wanted to get that had the letter F starting with it. He was faithful in his footling. The word footling means the little things, the insignificant things. He was given little tasks as a slave, little responsibilities, daily routines. And in all the daily mundane routines, he did it to his best. He did it faithfully, day in, day out. He was not getting a pay. 
No, slaves don't get no pay. No salary. Nobody saying, well done. Nobody clapping. He did it faithfully. He was faithful in the little. Here's the biblical principle. Luke chapter 16 and verse 10. He who is faithful in little. This is a biblical principle. He who is faithful in little will be faithful in much. He who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. If you want God to expand your borders this year, if you want to be an influential person, you got to start being faithful in the little things, in the things that most people don't see as important, in the things that you will never get an approval for or a clap for or a praise for. you got to be faithful in the ordinary, faithful in the day-to-day routines. Be faithful to feed your kids. Be faithful to show up for your wife. Be faithful in the daily routines. Be faithful in filing your paperwork at work. Be faithful in your income taxes. Be faithful in the routine. Because who is faithful with little will be faithful with much. And he is faithful with whatever little Potiphar puts into his hands. That is where he starts. Because too many people want a platform or a position to start being faithful. If you aren't faithful with little, you will never be faithful with much. I probably shouldn't say this, but there are some talented people in our house that I've put to serve in a car park to see if they'll be faithful with little before giving them a mic to hold. Sorry. Because the lead vocalist could hit a bad note and nobody would be bothered. But if you buff someone up on that car park, they may never come back here. And you got to be faithful with the things that no one sees, that no one recognizes, that does not give you an opportunity to hold a mic and be seen by people. When you are faithful with little, you will be faithful with much. He is faithful in the footling. He has no position. This year, stop looking for positions. Influential people don't need positions. You don't need a job title. You don't need a position in this church. You don't need a position in your community as counselor. You don't need a position to be influential. Influence is based on the life that you live. If you live a life that honors God, if you honor Him in your speech, in your conduct, in your purity, in your love, and in your faith, God will make you a person of influence. Joseph has nothing. He has no position. He's a slave, but he is faithful. And he becomes the most influential person in Potiphar's house. He moves from being on the bottom to where Potiphar starts noticing that anything I give this man to do, he does it with excellence. Did you hear that? Anything he gives this man to do, he does it with excellence. Anything that you are given to do this year, do it with excellence. Especially when it does not benefit you. Do it with excellence. Serve with excellence. Everything that is given into his hands, he does it with excellence. Not only does he does it with excellence, but because he honors God, here's what happens. God honors Joseph. Because you are not going about this year without a heavenly father that is ready to bless you. I want you to understand that. You are not going about this year based on your ability. There is a supernatural God that is going to bless you, that is going to prosper what is in your hands when you are faithful to him. Genesis chapter 39 and verse 5. It says that Potiphar, he noticed something. Here's what he noticed. So it was from the time that he made Joseph overseer of his house and all that he had. Here's what happened. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house. Now, The Bible makes sure in this verse to identify who God Potiphar serves. Potiphar is not an Israelite. He's not serving Yahweh. He's an Egyptian. He's serving the gods of Pharaoh. He's serving all the gods from Yu-Gi-Oh. And they want you to understand here that even though He is unsaved. Check this, right? The owner of the house, the owner of the business, your boss, 
He is not a servant of God. But watch this. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house. Why? For Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in the house and in the field. Why? For Joseph's sake. You might not like your boss. He might be corrupt. Maybe you work for... <coughs> All right. <laughs> Let me stop right there. Randy, we work... <laughs> but I want you to know that if God has placed you there, he will bless because you are there. Because you are managing the resources. That's why we are raising up people of influence. So even though you might not be prime minister, if you serve in the cabinet, God will bless because you are there managing the resources. I want you to understand, even if your boss is a little bit corrupt or maybe plenty corrupt, if you are in that space as a person of influence, even in a place of evil, even in a place of unrighteousness, even in a place where they serve false gods, guess what? That place will be blessed because you are managing the resources, because God's hand is upon your life and what is placed in your hands, he will bless. The house of the Egyptian is blessed because Joseph is in it. Tell the person next to you, your house will be blessed because God is in it. Your family will be blessed because God is in it. Your job will be blessed because God is in it. Your business will be blessed because God is in it. And Joseph is faithful to God and God blesses him. But as the blessings of God flew, the enemy is seeking to destroy. And I don't want to just build you up and encourage you and don't tell you the reality that you will face opposition. Because Joseph has a dream he faces some disappointment. He is determined. But along the journey comes distraction. All is going well in Potiphar's house. Everything on the Potiphar's house is given into Joseph's hand to oversee. But here comes Potiphar's wife. And with longing eyes, she desires Joseph. Now, The tricky thing about it is that she desires Joseph not because of who he is as a slave, but because of the hand of God over his life. A woman with a wealthy man like Potiphar is attracted to that wealth, attracted to that sense of drive and determination and prosperity. She's not really attracted to Joseph. She's attracted to what he offers. And she comes before Joseph. The Bible says day in and day out as a distraction. Now, it might be easy to say no once. Twice might be a little bit hard. But day in and day out, this distraction keeps knocking at your door. Anybody in that space? I'm not talking about a woman. I'm saying that day in, day out, this distraction is trying to destroy God's destiny for your life. Day in, day out, might be friends, might be family, might be the place that you live. Day in, day out, this distraction keeps coming. For some, it might be sex. For some, it might be money. For some, it might be power. This distraction keeps coming day in, day out. In 2020, Carl Lentz, the former pastor of Hillsong, New York City, made a confession on social media that he was unfaithful to his wife. Now, the mistress that he was with actually came forth and publicly made statements that they were in an adulterous relationship. And Pastor Carl Lentz at that time, who was one of the leading pastors in the U.S. when it comes to being around influential people, being around celebrities, being around pop stars, having a mega church in the U.S., he is removed from his position as senior pastor and the enemy destroys what God was building in his life because he felt temptation to a distraction. 
Now, thankfully, after stepping down from ministry, he went through reconciliation. And according to recent updates, he and his wife and his family are in a healthy space. But he's no longer serving as a lead pastor. No longer the pastor for the last three years, going on four years. Why? Because he fell for a distraction. Potiphar's wife is a distraction in Joseph's destiny. And for some, it might be different things. But this year, as you move towards being a person of influence, there will be distractions. This moment in Joseph's life is a pivotal point. It is a moment that can actually destroy Joseph's destiny. And I see two things that Joseph does in this moment to dodge what the enemy has sent to destroy him. The first thing he does, you can write it down tonight. Joseph affirms that he is a manager, not an owner. This is very important. Genesis chapter 39 and verse 8. He says to Potiphar's wife when she makes advancements towards him. It says, but he refused and said to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in this house. And he has committed all that he has into my hands. Do you see the distinction here? Joseph affirms that he is a manager, not an owner. He is managing Pharaoh, um, Potiphar's resources. He is managing Potiphar's house. He does not own Potiphar's house. He does not own what he is managing. The reason this is so important is because I believe ownership is a satanic principle. It is not biblical. The kingdom of God is owned by God. The earth and everything in it is owned by God. And each one of us in this house are managers of God's resources. So the influence that you have, the money that you have, the business that you have, you do not own it. You are a manager of God's resources. The reason that this is important is because when you own things, you stop consulting God to make decisions. But when you affirm your role, I am a manager, you always seek the owner's best interests. So the owner's best interest is not for me to sleep with his wife. I want you to understand this. Because when temptation comes, you got to ask yourself, what is the owner's best interest? Like, what does God want me to do with this money? What does God want me to do with my family? What does what God want me to do with this job? What does he want me to do with this education? What does he want me to do with this career? What does he want me to do in this community? When challenges come, you got to ask yourself, what does the owner want? you got to open his Bible and read his word. Here's what Joseph says, I cannot sin and do this wickedness against my God. Because while he is managing Pharaoh's resources, God owns everything. And while he serves in Pharaoh's house, guess who he's really serving? He is serving God in everything that he does. So if I'm serving God, I got to find out what is sinful unto God and what is pleasing unto God. And sleeping with my owner's wife is sinful. I cannot do this sinful thing against God. And he dodges this distraction of the enemy that is meant to destroy him because he affirms his rule. I am a manager, not an owner. Tell the person next to you, I am a manager, not an owner. I do not own my wife. I do not own my kids. I do not own them. I am a manager, not an owner. The woman now started to smile. <laughs> I am a manager, not an owner. Ownership is a worldly principle. 
Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve. And when you understand that you are a manager, guess what? You lead through serving. That's what everybody is called in our church, servant leaders. Because you can't lead until you serve. You can't climb the corporate ladder until you stoop and you serve and wash the feet of the followers of Jesus. Just like Jesus washed his disciples' feet until you are humble, God will not exalt you. And Joseph understands that he's a manager. He's not an owner. He's not an owner. He's a manager. He's not an owner. He's a manager. The second thing that Joseph does to dodge this distraction is he depends on God to fulfill the dream. You can write that down tonight. He depends on God to fulfill the dream. He depends on God to fulfill the dream. When we started tonight, remember what we started with? A dream. Joseph had a dream. Now, in his dream, he is ruling over his brothers. He's in a position of authority, a position of power, a position of leadership. It started with a dream. Remember the sheaves bowing down to his sheaf and the moon and the stars and the sun bowing down to him? It started with a dream. Potiphar's wife is more of a power play than pleasure. Now, I haven't watched a lot of Bold and Beautiful. And Lifetime movies bore me within two minutes. But I've heard stories. And from what I understand, this is a power play. Because he could sleep with Potiphar's wife. And then he could put some rat poison in Potiphar's food. And the house now would belong to Potiphar's wife. And then he can be the new Potiphar. And then it will be his house. I will show my brothers I made it. I will show the people that laughed at me, backstabbed me, I made it. I did it. I got to the dream. This is a power play. He can easily grab on. The dream that he had, that he probably has lost hope in, because he's a slave now. He's not in his father's house anymore. And God said he would be a leader. God said he would raise him up. This is a moment that he can take matters into his own hands. And there will be moments where you can justify you can justify your sin and say, this is what God wants. He gave me this dream, and now I'm just making it happen. This is the opportunity. Like, it is opposite to God's word, but this is the opportunity. I feel it in my spirit. This is what God wants. It is sin. It is bribery. It is a shortcut. It is pushing someone else down to step on their back to get where you want to be. And God says no. I want to tell somebody in this house tonight, God says no. This is not his way. This is not his plan. This is not how the dream becomes a reality. And Joseph does not fall prey to Potiphar's wife. Why? Because he's determined that God will be the only one that fulfills this dream. Do you not think that would have crossed his mind day in and day out when Potiphar's wife keeps coming at him? Do you not think that she probably whispers those sweet lies into his ears? Hey, you could be the owner of this house. I can make it all happen. Do you not think that the temptation was there? But he said, no, God. God is going to be the one that fulfills this dream. God gave it. He will fulfill it. I'm determined to let God make it a reality. And we need some people this year in this house that are determined to let God make it a reality. I'm not going to make it on my own. I'm not going to make it on my will. I'm not going to make it on my resources. God is going to make it a reality. Joseph has a dream. Joseph faces some discouragement. But he gets back up and he's determined. 
And this chapter ends with him facing off with this distraction, a pivotal moment in his life. And it does not end well. It does not end well for Joseph. Potiphar's wife changed the narrative and she goes to Potiphar and says, this slave tries to rape me. Potiphar in anger tosses Joseph into a prison. This chapter does not end well. It does not end well for Joseph. He does what is right. He stands by God's word. He came from the bottom, now he's on the top, and now everything, everything is ripped away again. This could have been the place for him. This could have been the fulfillment of God's dream. But God's picture for your life is much bigger than your expectations. I got a spoiler alert for you because this is not the end of Joseph's story. It might be the end of the chapter, but it's not the end of his story. It might be the end of a chapter, but it's not the end of your story. It might be the end of a relationship, but it's not the end of your story. It might be the end of your career, but it's not the end of your story. It might be the end of a chapter, but it's not the end of your story. Because God takes him and brings him to a place where he finally fulfills purpose in the king's palace. And we will get there on the journey in the next few weeks. But I want to speak to you. You right now. Spoiler alert, this is not the end of your story. It's the end of a chapter. It's the end of an era. Some things might die this year. You will go through some disappointments, some hurt and some pain. And when you think it's all well and good, God might break it all down again because he has even greater in store. And in the place of slavery, in the place of being captive, in Potiphar's house, guess what? We see a person of influence being birthed. He was not influenced in his father's house. He had the court. He had his father's favor, but he had no influence. And is in a place of slavery, in a place of bondage, in a place that nobody wants to be in, that we see a person of influence is booted. This is a different Joseph from the Joseph that we read about in his father's house. This is a man that knows how to manage resources. This is a man that when he speaks, the other slaves follow because he's a person of influence. This is a man that found favor in the sight of an ungodly, unrighteous man. This is a different Joseph. You're going to end this year as a different man, a different woman. God might break some things out. You might go through some disappointments. But as you determine yourself to press on, God is going to lift you up and he's going to birth inside of you a person of influence. You might not like the process or the pain that comes in it, but in the heat and pressure, God is molding a diamond that will truly be exemplary of his image and likeness and his purpose for your life. I don't know about you, but I want God to raise me up and fulfill the dreams that he's placed over my life because I'm going to be a person of influence that God has called me to be. And in these moments, in his disappointment, He's determined. In the end, he overcomes the distraction. And this is where we stop the story for today. This is the cliffhanger. He's now in prison. Next week, we'll continue from Joseph in the prison cell. And we'll see how much more he grows, again, as a person of influence. But I want to speak to you in this house tonight. Maybe you're in that place of disappointment. Maybe you're in that place where you want to get back up and be determined to fulfill God's plan. Maybe you're in a place where you just got the dream and you don't know what to do with it. Maybe you told the wrong people and you got the wrong interpretation. Tonight, God is saying, bring those dreams before me. I gave it, I will bring the interpretation for it. God is saying in your disappointment, he is with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He is here to lift you up. God is saying tonight, be determined. Be determined to press on. Forget the former things and be faithful in the footling. And as you focus on God's purpose for your life, don't be distracted. God will fulfill the dreams that he's placed over your life. He has called you to influence. I want to invite you to stand all around this house tonight.